And it looks like you're being live streamed right now. If you want to go ahead and get started, I think they're trying to get everybody um, seated. Okay, great. Um, well, um, if we've got a quorum in the uh, chamber, let's go ahead and get get started. Uh, I'd like to call to order the Public Safety Committee meeting for April 17th, 2024. It is just after four o'clock p.m. And I uh, first of all, I want to tell you, I'm sorry I had a uh, conference I had to go to. So that's why I'm not there in person. I apologize. But uh, if we could start the meeting with a moment of silence, please. Amen. Thank you. And I think minutes were sent out by Jennifer Cook last Friday for March 20th, 20, 2024. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved. Been moved. Was it seconded? Not yet. Second. All right. Thank you. Uh, minutes have been... Um, Okay, let's see. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes have been approved. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, police department approve a um, law enforcement assistance and support agreement with the Medical University of South Carolina Department of Public Safety. Move for approval. All right, we have a motion to approve and a second. All right, any discussion, questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, moving on to uh, item number four, a police department approve a law enforcement assistance and support agreement with the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office. Can I get an approval for that, please? Move for approval. Did I get a second? The mics need to be on. Second, Tinkler. Okay, thank you. Um, so we had a motion to approve and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion approves. Um, all right, so next up, police department, after the fact, approval to submit an application for Fled State Homeland Security Program grant in the amount of $15,796. Funds will be used to purchase personal radiation detectors for the explosive devices team. There's no match required for this grant. Move for approval. Second. second. Okay, a motion to approve and a second. Any further conversation on that? Questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any oppose? The ayes have it. Okay. Um, we are on item number six. Um, after the fact, approval to submit an application for the Law Enforcement Mental Health and Wellness Grant in the amount of $200,000. Funds will be used to train and expand Charleston Police Department peer support team. There is no match required for this grant. Move for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion on that item? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, uh, fire department uh, approval to submit the 2023 assistance to firefighter grant in the amount of 231000 for hazardous materials detection and identification devices, a 10% match. Uh, for this grant, and the amount of $21,000 will be budgeted for 2025. Move for approval. Second. Second. Okay, a motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, uh, fire department approval to submit the 2024 state homeland security grant in the amount of $56,000 for the Charleston Fire Department urban search and rescue team. No financial impact with this grant for the 24 or 25 budget. There is no match for this grant. Move for approval. Second. All in favor, please approval. say. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. 
Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. Fire Department approval to submit the 2024 State Homeland Security Grant in the amount of $60,400, Charleston's Low Country Incident Management Team. There is no financial impact with this grant in the 24 or 25 budget. There is no match. Move for approval. Second. All right. We have a motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion on that? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. Next up, we have a uh, presentation by the Charleston County Emergency Management Division. Uh, Mr. Ben Webster, who's the Deputy Director of Emergency Management for Charleston County. And this was requested by Councilman McBride. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Ben Webster. I'm the Deputy Director of Emergency Management for Charleston County Government. I'm joined by our Deputy County Administrator, Mr. Eric Watson, and Councilwoman Jenny Honeycutt. We appreciate the time to be here today. We appreciate being able to educate everyone on what Charleston County Emergency Management can provide. But the first thing I'll say, our goal and our mission as Charleston County Emergency Management is to support the residents and municipalities of Charleston County. We are hand in glove with the Charleston Fire Department and Emergency Management. We're excited to build our relationship uh, from what we've already had over past years. But what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is, again, how can we support the city of Charleston? We're going to talk a little bit about evacuation, a little bit about sheltering, a little bit about resource ordering. Any questions you have, please don't feel free to ask. We'll dive into them as best as we can and get you good answers today. So Charleston County, we talk hurricanes and we think hurricanes all the time, but we don't just deal with hurricanes in Charleston County. 14 recognized hazards, and we have to recognize that a lot of these hazards as well come off of hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, storm surge. Um, we are an all hazards department. Our emergency operations plan is all hazard and all encompassing. So it's very important for today, while we are going to focus on hurricanes, we recognize everything that Charleston County is susceptible to. For the purposes of today, uh, this, these are the phases of emergency management. We're really going to delve into the preparedness and response side uh, and educate everyone on what we can do for preparedness and response. The first thing that comes up with emergency management and after every incident, we talk about what could have been better, what could we, we have done differently, and it's communication. Several things that I'm going to hit on on this is first off our Everbridge Community Alert System. And I'll direct your attention to the Charleston County Hurricane Guide that I passed out prior to the meeting. In there, you will find that same QR code. And if you want to scan it now, I recommend you do. That takes you to the Everbridge sign-up portal. What Everbridge is, is a subscriber-based notification system that we're able to send out information such as upcoming storms, warnings, watches, uh, and things such as that to our residents for them to be aware early on. In addition to that, and it's important to differentiate between the two, Everbridge is subscriber-based. We have to get your help to be able to push that information out and have residents sign up for Everbridge. But the integrated public alert and warning system, I think everybody's probably had it where your phone's just sitting there, it's silent, and then all of a sudden it screams at you, right? That is the integrated public alert and warning system. It also covers TV stations, news radio, um, several others. We are currently working as Charleston County to become an alerting authority on this so that we can generate these messages locally and we can send them out quickly and efficiently. That can be done at the city's request as well. Um, currently, the process for that is the city would come to us and we would go through the state. Again, we're looking to streamline this significantly more to help our residents. The next thing we talk about is communication. During an activation of our emergency operations center, we open up what's called a JIC, a joint information center, and we invite any public information officer within Charleston County government and our municipal partners to be part of that joint information center. So what I ask with this for your help is during a major event, please, please, please follow Charleston County government on Facebook and X, Charleston County Emergency Management and the Charleston County Department of Public Safety. That information that's posted on those social media platforms is real time, it's accurate, and it's coming directly out of the Emergency Operations Center. We ask that you share that on your social media platforms. Now, if you have specific information for the city of Charleston, please generate your own messaging. But we wanna make sure to the best of our abilities that we generate one message for our residents with one call to action. 
In addition to that, and this is for our government partners in the room, palmettoeoc.com, and I would attribute this so, to the uh, Facebook of emergency management. We're going to talk about it a little bit more, but when we look at our common operating picture in the emergency operations center, it is Palmetto EOC. Significant events that happen with the Illinois County, resource requests, and any other information that needs to be distributed to our partners. Your government, your emergency managers have access to Palmetto EOC and use a lot, utilize it greatly. We continue to provide training on this and continue to push that this, this be our common operating board. In addition to this, um, your emergency managers join us uh, during a disaster daily, if not multiple times a day on the Tri-County Conference call. This is a time to share with our partners what's going on, what's, what does this disaster look like, what are the reports, and what are the needs. We always want to have a municipal representative on that from all of our municipalities. And like I said, the city of Charleston's always been great at doing that for us. So I talked a little bit about we're going to delve into the preparedness side. The first thing that we do from the emergency management department is we do public education. We ask you and we almost beg of you, if you have an event within the city or for your residents, please have us. We'd love to come out, especially pre-hurricane season and talk about hurricanes distribute the literature like you have on your desk, as well as a bunch of other ed education information. All you have to do to this is go to charlestoncounty.org forward slash EM and fill out a speaker request. We would be more than happy to come out and help with public education and speaking events. In addition, and I mentioned that it is hot off the presses as of two days ago, but um, I passed out the Charleston County Hurricane Guide as well as the State Hurricane Guide. You will see a new State Hurricane Guide for this year. I gave you last year's model. Uh, but we really want to take with the state guide. We're looking at that 50,000 foot view of hurricanes in, in South Carolina. With that Charleston guide, we're looking at that 10,000 foot view. What matters to Charleston County? What are our evacuation routes look like? What are our transportation pickup points look like? That is already 250 have already been ordered for the city. We expect to give you significantly more. Anywhere you can help us distribute those would be very great and very appreciated. In addition to that, during the off-season, we do training. Any training that is provided by the Charleston County Emergency Management Department is free to all of our partners. This includes incident management training, uh, communications training, as well as a plethora of other things. We recommend that our municipal partners join us in those. And again, they are completely and totally free of charge. In addition to that, we do exercises yearly. Our next one will be our full-scale exercise for a hurricane situation on June 5th of this year. We bring all 110 people into our EOC and we practice for the real thing. We make sure that our plans work. And going with our plans, we don't just review plans at the beginning of hurricane season, we review plans year round. We wanna make sure that everything we do is codified and exercised. So what happens in the early days of the storm? We all see it. There's a storm that's all the way out there. It doesn't matter to us yet, right? Absolutely wrong for emergency management. When we start to see storms come off of Africa, we start to look, we start to evaluate what could this do for Charleston County? What could we do to respond to this incident? One of the first things we do, especially during hurricane season, is our daily operations brief. This is for our government partners, talks about what, what do these storms look like? Where are we going with this? What preparations are we taking? As well as what other all hazards events do we currently have in the county? Again, that's open for all of our government partners. We monitor the event early. We have discussions early. We, prep, we prepare our building. We make sure that we're ready for when we bring 100 or so people into that building that we're ready to respond adequately for Charleston County. We can staff our EOC on a partial level. In the early days of a storm, we're gonna bring in our core partners. That includes representatives from our municipalities should they wish to join us. And we're going to start that pre-planning for the storm. As we get closer to the storm, as the situation changes and grows, we grow that EOC to bring even more partners in with us. We develop an incident action plan. Now we recommend for all of our partners continue to develop your own tactical incident action plan specific to your agency. But through the Alistar platform that all of our partners have access to, we're able to share our incident action plan so that we can make sure our goals and objectives are one set of goals and objectives for the county. I mentioned Palmetto EOC a little bit already and I stress again, we provide training for that year round. We want our government partners to be operating on that platform. A phone call to the EOC can go a long way, but when everyone in the EOC can see, see the same picture at the same time, it goes an even further away. And I've hit on the Everbridge notification system already. So what does response look like? 
The first thing is day to day emergency managers don't just work when there's a disaster. We're here to support 24 7, 365. And the way we do that is through our Charleston County Emergency Management Duty Officer. This is a 24 7 position. They are on call for our government partners at any time. They can handle logistics, planning, command needs, anything that you need to help take the burden off of some of your responders for that those big picture events were only a phone call away. In addition to that, we support pre-planned events. We have an individual by the name of Todd Shippey. He's our external planner, and his job is to liaise with our private partners and our public partners to make sure when we have private events such as the PGA tournament, the Kiowa Marathon, and other events that happen throughout the county, that we can provide those government partners that are needed and that planning that's needed from a government point of view. During a major event, like I mentioned already, we activate the Emergency Operations Center in North Charleston. And you see a picture of that almost fully staffed on the top right. The purpose of an Emergency Operations Center is to be able to communicate quickly and effectively with the needed partners. Now I say that to say this, a Municipal Emergency Operations Center is great for that tactical level information. What are we doing with boots on the ground? But it is absolutely paramount that we have an individual that can represent your municipality in that emergency management uh, emergency operation center. It is also paramount that that individual will become a command level staff officer to be able to make decisions for the agency on the fly. In addition to that, during the major event, we open our community information line. And at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna give you the number for that. I'd appreciate it if you take it down and as we get closer to the season that you share that with your constituents. They can call, they can talk to a real person, they can ask real questions, and get those hurricane guides and those evacuation routes and those transportation pickup points and those sheltering questions answered by a real person. And that's offered in both English and Spanish. In addition to that, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit on the next slide, is our transportation pickup points and our sheltering as well as evacuation. So if you have driven around Charleston County, you have seen that uh, sign on the top right, hurricane evacuation bus stops. In most cases where CARTA serves the residents, they're located with CARTA bus stops. As we go outside of that service area, they're still throughout the county. The purpose of that transportation pickup point is to take for the underserved population that might not have adequate transportation to a shelter. It can pick them up. It's either a CARTA or first student school bus, pick them up at that location, take them to a safe shelter, and then take them back home once it's safe to do so. Speaking of shelters, we want to push pre-planning. Have people have a conversation with their family and their friends. What does it look like if I have to leave my home? We want people to go with friends. We want people to go with family. Shelters are a shelter of last resort. And I say hotels up there as well, but one of the things we have to recognize is hotels aren't always the best option. If Florida evacuates as well and individuals are coming up I-95, that I-95 corridor is going to fill fast. Push for people to have a pre-plan on what they're going to do with their family. In addition to that, we have evacuation routes. You've probably seen the sign at the bottom throughout the county as well. What we talk about with evacuation routes, if you reference the South Carolina Hurricane Guide or hurricane.sc, it'll show you every evacuation route in the state. We want people to follow those routes. We work closely with our law enforcement partners to man traffic control points and direct individuals to the most safe and efficient way to evacuate the area that they're in. In addition to evacuation, we'll come back to that in a minute, Palmetto EOC, again, for resources. It's very important that we be able to get you the resources you need, the right resources, and those resources as quick as possible. The best way to do that is a resource request through Palmetto EOC. Now, it's very important to note with this that there is a cost that comes with resource requests, and we're able, with the right information, we can get you that cost up front so you can plan from your point of view. In addition to that, we ask that when you fill out a resource request, you tell us why you need it, not just what you need. In many cases, through emergency operations, we're able to source other, other agencies to be able to fill your need. Give us some information of why. We'll help find it. We'll help with the logistics of it. So as I mentioned, and it's a hot topic, it's a huge question, as it absolutely should be. Know your zone. In 2024, May of this year, the South Carolina Emergency Management Division is releasing new zone maps. And if you look on, I believe it's page eight of your Charleston County Hurricane Guide, you'll see those new zones. We are ecstatic that these are new. We're ecstatic to be able to work with the South Carolina Emergency Management Division 
And you'll notice the change on these from past years. Where we would evacuate far, far inland for a coastal run or storm, we don't have to do that anymore. We've aligned our coastal communities, our beach communities in zone A, so we can do a much, much lighter evacuation. That helps alleviate traffic concerns, that helps alleviate sheltering. It lets people stay home when it's safe for them to stay home. For more information on this, like I said, South Carolina Hurricane Guide, which will be released in May, our Hurricane Guide, which will be officially released in May, and Hurricane.sc. And I'll answer a question that always comes up when we start talking about know your zone and evacuation. Does Charleston County close bridges? And for this answer, I'll direct you to the last page, the very last page on the last cover of your Charleston Hurricane Guide. We do not. We issue advisories. At 30 miles an hour or above, we recommend that large vehicles don't go over the bridges, our high span bridges, which you'll see listed there, and I'm sure many of you know them. And at condition red, which is over 40 miles an hour, we recognize it may no longer be safe to put our first responders on those bridges. And outside of information on SCDOT signs, there may not be warnings. So where do we need help here? When we issue these advisories through our, lo our local news, our Facebook, our X, and other social media platforms, we need shares. We need you to help us get this information to your residents so that they know it's not safe for them to go over these bridges. Additional information on re-entry. When can I come back? When can I get back to my home? When can I get back to my business? If you go to charlestoncounty.org forward slash EM on the top right side, you're gonna see a re-entry tab or a dash pass tab. This is very important for your local businesses that before hurricane season, they go to this tab, they fill out the information, they provide us with the requisite information so that we can have this for our ESF 13 team, which is our law enforcement team in the EOC, so that we can make sure that the people that need to be in are the people that actually get in and we keep out those that should not be in those areas. So the burning question, everyone always wants to know, what, what's it look like this year? What is hurricane season going to be here in Charleston County? From Colorado State University, just released a couple of weeks ago, an above normal hurricane season. But I ask everyone, how many hurricanes does it take to make a life-altering event for Charleston County? It's one hurricane. One storm is all it takes. It doesn't matter how many named storms we have. It doesn't matter what the Atlantic Basin looks like. One storm can change our history. So I again push this to you, please, please, please help us make your residents aware of the hazards, of the pre-planning that needs to take place, what needs to be in their emergency kit, help us get them hurricane guides and help us educate our public. Um, and I will make this available afterwards as well. I know it's kind of hard to see. And again, Colorado State University hurricane forecast uh, for 2024, again, an above active season. And finally, if we can ever be of assistance, emergency management at charlestoncounty.org or 846-3800. I also want to direct your attention to the very bottom for our community information line. Again, when our EOC is staffed, that line is staffed. If you have a resident that has a question, they need something answered, they want to know their route, they want to know their zone, or they just want to work through what they need to safely do during a hurricane, they can call this number or they can call extension 3909. 24-7 is also staffed with the Spanish-speaking individual. So with that, I thank you for the time, and are there any questions that I can answer? Let's have some comments. This is uh, uh, Councilman Jim McBride for Johnson, James Allen, District 3. I'm not asking to, to necessarily answer. I'm going to ask a lot of just, just some concerns that I have Absolutely. that I, you and I have been talking. So it's just kind of for everyone's situational awareness, what I'm thinking about for Johns Island and James Island, and why I asked for you to come here. I'm grateful for you, for you to come and for Councilwoman Honeycutt to, to come and for uh, Councilman Shealy to allow this to be on the agenda item. So just some concerns that I have, and I'll be working with uh, the county and the city um, representatives to come up with um, some uh, information that I want to put out to the public for District 3 in June. I'm going to focus on the month of June being a information campaign for District 3 to inform Johns and James Island uh, residents as to the things they can, they can consider. And here's some reasons why really quick. The population on Johns Island and Kiowa from 2010 to 2020 has increased by 50%, uh, which is ex obviously, as we all know, exceeded the road capacity that we have, uh, especially on Johns Island. With the rapid uh, population increase, there are a lot of people on Johns Island, especially who have not been through a hurricane, never mind a hurricane evacuation. 
Um, there are only two ways on and off John's Island. Um, and I was informed the last time I talked to our, uh, the city's emergency management team that the Stone River, where the Stone River Bridge meets John's Island is a low point on John's Island. Um, I don't know if that makes it more vulnerable, but my intuition says that it, it might be more, more vulnerable for um, during storm surge or just some uh, vulnerable, a vulnerable point, um, which is one of our main egress routes. Obviously, there's a lot of live oaks on Johns Island and James Island, which is why people love it and why people move there. But live oaks can get knocked down in storms and often do, can block, um, you know, main routes such as River Road, uh, Bohicket Road, et cetera, and uh, Riverland, Riverland Drive. Um, let's see. And of course, there's uh, a large subsidized housing portion of Johns Island. And, you know, I talked offline about, about that, um, just concerned about getting them off the island for an evacuation since most of them don't have uh, transportation means of their own. So those are just some brainstorm thoughts I've, I've had and why I kind of wanted to bring this up, you know, uh, being my first uh, hurricane season as a city councilman, just want to be as prepared as I can and inform the public the best I can with the team of the county and the city. Right, and absolutely, to hit on some of those, uh, as you mentioned, the Stone River Bridge is not an evacuation route officially. And part of that is the South Carolina Department of Public Safety, Highway Patrol, Bureau of Protective Services, and State Transport Police. Put a significant amount of time and effort in the off season doing traffic studies on these and vulnerability studies. And those evacuation routes are set by them for what appears to work best with what we're looking at. Uh, we mentioned, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up again for that underserved population. I really want to point on those transportation pickup points that are located in the Charleston County Hurricane Guide. For an individual that can't safely get to a shelter by their own means, they can be picked up from either a school bus or a car to bus, taken to a safe shelter, and once it's safe, taken back. I think another thing that hits us in the positive with evacuations this year, there's evacuation zones that have changed. We're going to be, for a coastal runner storm, which is our most common, evacuating a significantly less amount of people, therefore alleviating some of the traffic concerns. Um, also, I remind everyone that evacuations take place ahead of time. Uh, we are, it is our goal to get everyone out of there before the onset of tropical storm force winds. Uh, while trees and grand oaks are still certainly a concern, we want people out of there before tropical storm force winds. Just one quick follow up comment. Just talking to a lot of constituents uh, in District 3, I've noted a sense of complacency, particularly if we've gone through a, a big hurricane that was very successful, like Matthew. The, the, the consensus I hear is that was a really good evacuation, no issues, but people didn't live through previous hurricanes, but didn't go so well. And all hurricanes are different. You know, I remember just watching hurricanes hit in Florida and Louisiana um, that, you know, people go to bed thinking it's going to be no more than maybe a, a week category three. It's still a category two when they go to bed to wake up the next morning. It's a category four. Mm -hmm. Things like that can happen. So I just want to um, just, again, just saying this out loud, just to don't want people to get complacent just because it's gone well in the past that there could be unforeseen circumstances that we need to prepare for. Absolutely. We appreciate that statement. Every storm is different. Significant rapid intensification is a real thing and it's a real concern. We appreciate the statement on that. It is yeah. absolutely true. Any other questions I can answer? Well, thank you all very much for having me, Councilman. Thank you for inviting me. We appreciate the time being here and we're here to support the city of Charleston. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Webster. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming down. And uh, and Council Member Jenny Honeycutt, thank you for, for being here as well. Um, we really appreciate all the work that you do and, and the way you cooperate with all your municipalities, but of course with the city of Charleston. So thank you so much. Um, all right, uh, next on our agenda, we have a discussion regarding fire coverage on Johns Island. Um, and that was uh, brought to us uh, by the request of Council Member McBride as well. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have a PowerPoint. So while that's uh, being pulled up, there we go. So the, the conversation is, is fire protection on John's Island. And that really comes down to two separate um, entities providing the fire protection and how we work together. So I broke this presentation down into what the uh, present fire protection is.
So what the, the present fire protection is for the Charleston Fire Department and for the St. John's Fire Department, and then what the future plans are, how those things complement each other and what we should expect in, in upcoming years. So just talking about Charleston Fire Department resources on Johns Island. Currently, we have one firehouse. It's Station 17 on Bohicka Road. Traditionally, we've had four firefighters working out of that firehouse on a daily basis. Minimum staffing for Charleston Fire Department apparatus is four persons per apparatus. As we plan for Fire Station 23, which will be at Wilts Battery and Bohicket, I mean, Wilts Battery and Maybank, we plan to put an engine company and a ladder company in that firehouse, two, two units. So the planning for those units has spanned several years as we hire and train firefighters. Training the firefighters takes um, six months. So in 2023, we were able to hire the firefighters for ladder 106. They will eventually be at that new firehouse, but we were able to activate that unit in January of this year, put them at fire station 17. So currently the Charleston Fire Department assets on uh, Johns Island are eight personnel per day operating out of one firehouse, two units. In the near future, we will have station 23 at Wilts Battery in Maybank. We will add an additional four personnel to staff an engine company. We will shift ladder 106 from their current location at station 17. We will put them at station 23. In the planning phase, and you can see in that map on the bottom left, the planning phase includes two firehouses, two Charleston firehouses on Johns Island. One will be located in the vicinity of the Johns Island Airport off River Road. That will have one unit with four personnel. The other is in the other direction up River Road, so River and Brownswood, and that will have one unit with four personnel also. So if you look at our current and our proposed locations, Fire Station 17 is in place at Bohicket Road. There are some DOT widening conversations going on. There's a possibility that eventually we will lose that physical location for that firehouse. So we're already working with BFRC and real estate to identify a secondary location where we can relocate that firehouse if needed. Sort of in the, in the middle of your screen there, you'll see in the white box, it says proposed fire station 23 at Wilts Battery. That will sort of be the center of the hub for Charleston Fire Department fire protection on Johns Island. It's about, it's a little more than two and a half miles from the current fire station 17. You go up to River Road and if you use station 23 as the center, then um, station 27, up on Brownswood and River, that is going to be a, just a little over three miles away. And if you go in the other direction down towards the airport, Fire Station 24 will be right at three miles away. So we wanna keep that fire protection in, in three, three and a half, four mile increments. And that enables us currently to keep our response times where they need to be. One thing to note is the location of the Johns Island, I'm sorry, the uh, St. Johns, fire department locations in this area of Johns Island. So right there in the middle, there's a box that says uh, St. John's fire, fire station number one, soon to be closed. And I'll elaborate on that in a second. Then on the left-hand side, you'll see fire station number seven from the St. John's fire department. So to talk about the, the firehouse that is going to be closed, one of the great things about the relationship we have with our response partners is that we constantly talk, we constantly plan, and we have known, I've, I've been in Charleston for five and a half years now, I have known from the day I walked through the door that eventually that firehouse would be relocated. We have an agreement between the Charleston Fire Department and the St. John's Fire Department that that firehouse will not be relocated until we have adequate fire protection in place to cover the gap that that would conceivably create. By operating this way, obviously there will be no gap.
the reason we can do this is because we have automatic aid with St. John's Fire Department. There's actually seven fire departments in the area that operate under the same umbrella concerning how we deploy resources, which resources go to emergencies, and the playbook that we operate from. So you see Charleston and St. John's are part of that group. This really allows for seamless operation in the fire and the EMS realm. The most appropriate unit, regardless of jurisdiction, will be dispatched to any emergency that comes in. That's fire, that's EMS, combination type situations. The closest appropriate unit will go. We use the same playbook to fight fires. That is critically important for safe and efficient operation. And I really think the shining star here is that the Charleston Fire Department and the St. John's leadership teams meet annually by design so that we can coordinate our planning and our resource deployment. That's what keeps that St. John's firehouse in place until we have fire station 23 in place. That's what also enables us to shift our units around and make sure we maintain adequate coverage. So St. John's fire department protects a really large area in John's Island. They have seven fire stations, I'll focus on three of them because I'm really focusing on where the St. John's Fire Department and the Charleston Fire Department interface, that area where we're going to have a hospital eventually, those areas up towards River Road. So their station one is on Maybank Highway. They have three to four people um, uh, per day. Station seven on Main Road, they have two units there, six to eight people. Station five on River Road, one unit with three or four. They do have other firehouses, but you see they're down in Kiowa and they're in Waldenla. Now, when there are emergencies down there, by design, the Charleston Fire Department, without question, sends units to assist. The payoff is that when we have an emergency where we need more than the um, complement of firefighters we have on the island already, St. John's sends resources without question. So to summarize our fire protection, currently there are two Charleston Fire Department units, eight people per day. There are four St. John's units in close proximity to that Sinny County interface with 12 to 16 personnel. Why this is important is that depending on the emergency that is being dispatched, that determines the number of units and the number of firefighters we need to handle that emergency, we call it an effective response force. If you use a, a two-story home, which is very typical on Johns Island, two-story home is gonna require at minimum 17 firefighters arriving within seven and 13 minutes to effectively rescue and mitigate the emergency. By using resources from both fire departments, we can accomplish that. So in the near future, when station 23 opens at Wilts Battery in Maybank, Charleston Fire Department will then have three units with 12 personnel. It's at that point in time that the St. John's Fire Department is going to shift that station one fire protection on Maybank, and they're gonna shift it down towards Kiowa. So they will have nine to 12 personnel, but if you see, we're still at 21 to 24 personnel that can be dispatched. That's important because if 17 firefighters can handle a two-story house, you have to say, how many firefighters do we need to handle the hospital that's coming? This complement is going to put us right where we need to be. The next logical question is, if we can handle that one bigger emergency, what happens when all the other emergencies come in while we're handling the big one? That's where our future planning comes in place. So when we bring on board station 24, station 27, there'll be five Charleston units with 20 personnel per day. And there will be three St. John's units with nine to 12. That's going to give us 29 to 32. We have units in close proximity on James Island that come over routinely, both from the James Island Fire Department and the Charleston Fire Department. Then we have units in West Ashley that come over routinely 
from the St. Andrews Fire Department and the Charleston Fire Department. That is the beauty of the auto aid system. Uh, bottom left, last um, March, Brownswood Road, pretty well advanced structure fire. Those are Charleston and St. John's firefighters handling that by design. On the left, we have a social media post of us putting Ladder 106 in service in January. Again, that's doing nothing but augmenting fire protection on Johns Island. And the post on the right is uh, referencing a small fire that we had at St. John's High School. Again, just to underscore the close working relationship that the fire departments on the island have together. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I definitely have some questions. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, one of the issues that we deal with again on John's is thankfully Trident um, emergency room or emergency uh, clinic will be built soon, even mm -hmm. before the hospital. And that's because it's needed. So right now there isn't anything, you know, they have to come from J from James Allen typically. So the fire firefighters are uh, EMT trained, almost all, all of them. Yes, sir. And respond. So if someone has a heart attack, it's usually on John's Island. It's usually a, a firefighter that responds first. Yes, sir. So that's just something I want to bring up because there's a chain reaction here. There's other other parts of emergency management that you guys have to cover and cover mm -hmm. very well because of lack of other services on John's Island. I just want to point that out. Sure. And then as far as the 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 justification for the future stations, both mm -hmm. the one on um, Maybank that's that's funded and will be built starting hopefully next year or hopefully finished by next year at some point. Yes. Um, and then the two on river, is that based just purely on population within a certain area or what is the, how can you uh, summarize that in sure. one of terms? The easiest thing to say is it's, it's population driven, but if you dig deeper into it, it really comes down to the hazards that we see in the community, whether it's predominantly a residential community or if there's a mix between residential commercial. So we look at the hazards, and we match the effective response force to the hazard. And if we can't get the firefighters in place in the time frame that we know we have to have them there in order to make a positive difference, that's going to trigger the request for additional resources. And then the real trick is to try to project what you see now and what you, what you think you're going to see in 20 years. What's the road network going to look like at in, in 20 years, instead of having firehouses three miles apart, is the congestion going to be such that we need firehouses two miles apart? And to use a, a very simple reference, and it's not a fire reference, but you've already brought up EMS, for every minute somebody in cardiac arrest goes without effective CPR, they have a 10% less chance of surviving the incident. So I've already told you, that I need the first fire unit there in seven minutes. You can do the very, very quick math. We're typically the first ones there on a medical call. And that's by design. That's not a failure of the system. That's a design of the system. But if we're arriving in seven minutes, then a witnessed cardiac arrest, that patient has probably already gone 70% of the time he or she can go without having effective CPR. That's why it's so important that we position our resources properly. We keep them in service as we need to. We build redundancy into the system to handle the first call and then the second call. But then the, the really critical component that we are working on now, and it's Chief Jalaza's team that is doing it, it's public education. So that if it's gonna take us seven minutes to get to an emergency cardiac arrest, if we can have a bystander starting CPR within a minute, then we give that person a chance to live. Okay, and that's great. And um, and and when the new station is built on May Bank in 2025, then St. John's Fire will leave at some point after that. Is that the plan? Yes, sir. They're going to relocate. Okay, o off the island somewhere. We think. They're going to go down uh, towards Kiowa, uh, Betsy Carrison. Okay, that's yes, good. Sir. I didn't know mm -hmm. that. That's good. Yes, okay. Sir. But even after that new one's built, technically by population and all those other factors, we're still two sta stations short on John's Island. Yes, sir, by our current projections. And how much, anyone know how much it costs for this current station that's going to be built? How much that costs? 
I'm going off memory. I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of $11 million. Okay. And are there other parts of Charleston or districts that are as behind the curve? Yes, sir. Okay. The, the areas of the city that cause me the most concern currently for lack of coverage, it's uh, Johns Island and Keel, I mean, uh, Canehoy. So the likely approach that we will have trying to factor in the training that we have to provide to firefighters. There's a four year backlog on fire apparatus right now as a result of the pandemic. And then just funding. Uh, we will likely build a firehouse on Johns Island, build a firehouse in Canehoy, and we will jump back and forth. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Chief of May, um, it's a great question, one that we've been talking closely with the chief on and the whole department. And I, I do want to just take a minute to compliment uh, the chief and the Charleston Fire Department for uh, a job well done on thinking ahead, thinking through all of these nuances, highlighting um, these issues well in advance so that we can plan accordingly. I also want to uh, say um, how much I appreciate the the fire department's willingness and excitement uh, towards um, hiring a minority business to do a property search um, for future locations of firehouses so that we can be well ahead of this and, you know, not have to spend um you know, current market prices uh, in five years, uh, because we all know that land doesn't seem to be getting any cheaper. So we absolutely are trying to get well ahead of this, not just on Johns Island, but um, across the entire city. And uh, again, I just want to say uh, thank you to the chief and his team for uh, being so proactive on this. Um, I think it's going to be very impactful. Excuse me. Mitchell if, has his hand up. Yep, yeah, council member Mitchell. Council member. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I like to co compliment the uh, fire department what they're doing, because I, I mean, over a period of years, I think you all have mentioned. I heard me talk about Johns Island, and um, like Johns Island myself, you know, like I told my family, go back three hundred fifty years or more, uh, four hundred years more on Johns Island. So I know the status what happened on Johns Island, but uh, with the fire trucks and the public safety so far is concerned because I had many families that died because they, the hospitals were so far away. And um, with the fire trucks uh, going over there now and can give these uh, the treatment, early treatment, if you may, to assist a person with heart attacks or whatever the case may be, that's a plus because it, didn't, it wasn't there one time that way. We had the Johns Island Fire Department there, which was a small fire department on uh, Maybank Highway. And we only had the uh, EMS on Betsy Carrison, which was Bohickett Road at the time. So I can tell you wholeheartedly how that area was, because I was out there all the time from the 50s to the 60s and wherever the case may be. So, you know, doing it now, I know it's uh, some people thinking that it's a long way off of what we're doing now, but this is a big plus because with the growth that happened on Johns Island, and that's what happened with the growth that's happened, that we have to do a lot of these things that we needed now. But this was needed years and years ago. You see, so, you know, the, the people who was there waited all these years for this to happen. And now we are doing something now. So the uh, residents now just have to give it a little time and it's going to get there. You know, I know how they feel about it, but I figure I know how the people who was living there all these years felt about it, even back from Esau Jenkins' time. You see, so, you know, we just have to uh, applaud the fire department, what they're doing, and applaud that, you know, we got to know where the money is coming from to get all these things done, and we are doing the best we can and to provide public safety for all residents of Johns Island now since the growth have uh, expanded as such as it, is, as it is now. But I don't want people to forget, you know, even the past, what happened during that time when it wasn't there. And we had to, you know, really wait until this happened now, until this come about. And I still have family, excuse me, family there on that on River Road, Betsy Carrison, uh, even Bale Road, and all these other roads up in there in Jones and Blanding Drive and all that. I can name it, I can name it all. Because I played on that area all my life, you see. So I know about it. And I know wholeheartedly about Johns Island. You see, so I would thank the fire department for what they're doing and what they're planning on doing. 
And um, just hope that we as a city, along with the mayor and the council, that we can push and try to acquire whatever they need to have so they can keep going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mitchell. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Chief Curry. I can't see everybody in the chamber, but uh, it looks like I think uh, I don't think anybody's asking to be. Uh, no one's asking to speak. So, Chief Curry, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for all that you do and uh, all that all of your department does. Um, certainly, great people working on Johns Island. Appreciate all their work. So, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we will move on to uh, item number 12. Um, the, um, and unless Councilman McBride has anything else on his, since he brought it up, is that you good? Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. We'll move on to item number 12 then. Um, and uh, you probably saw in your packet that um, Mayor Coxwell had uh, put in recommendations for municipal court judge appointments. And in those recommendations, he has Chief Judge Thomas Morrison reappointment for four years, Judge Lindsey McLean Bird reappointment for two years, Judge Emmanuel Ferguson reappointment for two years, and an appointment for Peter Shade uh, for two years. I hear a motion to approve. So moved. I'll second it. I'll second it. Who was Peter Shade? <laughs> All right. So we have a motion to approve <laughs> and a second. Any discussion? I do want to just make a comment, uh, if I may, uh, just to give my sincere uh, appreciation and congratulation for Judge Maloney for his time serving the citizens of Charleston and the court system of Charleston. Um, He's been an icon on the bench and uh, look forward to honoring him in council chambers in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you uh, for his for his service. Well, one question. Um, is, is he retiring, um, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor? Uh, I think that just, would be uh, uh, the appropriate no, no. term. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't know. I just just ask him. I knew him a long time. I just just ask him. All right. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The ayes have it. And thank you to all of you who are serving there. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, just want to also just want to say thank you to everyone who showed up in person at council chambers and apologize that I wasn't able to be there today. And thank you for allowing me to chair this meeting, um, virtually. I appreciate it. Um, you look very official. You look very official. I would say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I certainly want to thank council member McBride and council member Tinkler and, uh, mayor Cogswell for being there in person and all of our staff who who showed up today as well, and uh, both virtually and in person. So if there's nothing else to come before this committee, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you.